Hey guys, how are you? Sorry for the late night session. <clears throat> Sorry for that late night session. Uh, I tried to come in. I tried to come in earlier, but I was doing a lot. I have no idea why it's doing this, man. Oh, my goodness. Is it going to start doing that again? Thank you. Well, you know what? I guess my connection is not too good. Buffering. I don't know what to tell you. I have no stinking idea. Oh, my goodness. I don't know why it's buffering for my channel, but I just did a live stream. I just did a live stream with the Catholic Apologetics YouTube channel. And so I was kind of late. And then even though, thank our brother, Protestant believer, he tried to schedule my discussion for today, last night, to get people prepared. When I went and tried to live stream it, it would not allow me to live stream. So I need specific software. So that means I can't give you advance notice, meaning I can't set it up, let's say, 24 hours beforehand and announce that I'm going to do a session tomorrow at this time because it requires specific <clears throat> software for me to get so that when I do that, I can then click and go live. So you got to have to wait for that. But as you can see, I'm in my apartment. This is my humble abode. <clears throat> Hopefully, I'm sorry for the people who are waiting. They probably went to sleep. Let's pray in Jesus' name. All the regulars can make it. Let's pray in Jesus' name. We can get the numbers up for the glory of Jesus Christ. And let's trust Jesus Christ, our Lord, that the Internet connection will be much stronger here by his grace and mercy, that the Internet is top quality by the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ and it stays strong for the glory of Jesus Christ. So this is my new home, abode. The only thing, the only thing that makes it lonely is that I don't have my kids here, but God is good. The Father is infinitely good. The Lord Jesus, the Father's eternal Son, His beloved Son, is infinitely good. The Holy Spirit, the eternal Spirit of the Father and Son, He is infinitely good, and He loves us and is in love with us. Father and Holy Spirit, the one God, so we trust in our God. We hope in our God. <clears throat> we love our God. We are in love with our God, even though we love Him imperfectly. And our hearts are the everlasting throne of the true God of all creation, the God of the Bible, who is the Father and His Son and the Holy Spirit. We love you, Father. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. Now, there was like an, a not, an you know, noxious smell last night, so I didn't know what it was. So I went and told the people, I go, hey, man, there may be a gas leak here, and I'm probably going to die. They said, no, there is no gas stove here, so you're okay. So pray in Jesus' name that if God is pleased, he wants me around to see my daughters grow up to be godly women and to use me to glorify his name. Pray Jesus gives me the health I need to lose weight, keep it off, get healthier, not just lose weight, and to make me holier, <clears throat> to take me to a higher level, higher level, all of us. Pray this for all of us, not just me. We, we <clears throat> go to a higher level by the power of the Spirit of holiness of purity, of righteousness, of obedience, of worship, of loving him, worshiping him, glorifying him, hoping in him, trusting in him, to have more power from the spirit to overcome our flesh, to crucify our flesh, to die to our flesh and be saved from the stain and fruit of our flesh so we can glorify Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And as you can tell, my voice is not that strong. Pray I stay healthy and strong for the glory of Jesus Christ. Yep, thank you guys. This is my humble abode. I still don't have enough furniture, right? So again, I just want to take a moment before I begin, and people are going to hear this later. Father, if you are pleased, bring in that regular crowd and increase the numbers for your glory, the glory of Jesus, the glory of Spirit, and sanctify the motives of my heart, purify the motives of my heart, purify us in the blood of Jesus Christ, not to do it for the praise of men, for fame or fortune, but for your glory. Now, <clears throat> just let you know, I want to thank you again. Okay, thank you again from my heart. Those of you who've been praying for me, 
those of you who have been fasting for me and my daughters, and those of you who have been supporting me financially, supporting the ministry. And I started a ministry, and I call it Christ for the World. That's now the name of my ministry, Christ for the World, because I want to be used by the Spirit to proclaim Jesus Christ throughout the whole world, and I'm trusting the Spirit to use me to bless you to do likewise. So thank you for your financial support. I really mean it. You know who you are. Thank the Lord Jesus for stirring your hearts to partner with me. It's because of your provision to the ministry. I'm able to get planted, stand on my feet, and provide for my daughters. Pray that I'm always able to provide for them. They, they lack nothing and to trust in Jesus Christ for our daily bread. So thank you, guys. May the Lord Jesus richly bless you, right? <clears throat> I know this is Coke Zero. I know it's poison, but I'll get rid of that poison in time. <clears throat> So again, let's just pray one more time saying, we love you, Father. Lord Jesus, we love you. Holy Spirit, we love you. And please, Father, for the sake of your son, grant us, grant me the health I need <clears throat> to be used by your spirit to glorify Jesus. Fill my lungs, my chest, my throat with the breath of life, Father. And I pray that you keep my brothers and sisters and their loved ones healthy by your spirit as we are washed in the blood of the Lamb, the Lord Jesus, and keep my daughters healthy, safe, and sound. Bless them and protect them physically, emotionally, mentally, and spiritually. Cover them, cover us with the blood of the Lamb and fill us with the Holy Spirit of life, Father. And Father, give us the holiness from your Spirit to delight you, Father, to delight Jesus, to delight your Holy Spirit and save us from our flesh and the stains of our flesh. Please, Father, bless this time, destroy all distractions from the enemy. Grant me clarity of thought and speech and loosen my tongue to speak clearly and recall passages correctly. And to bless your people, Father, and grant us wisdom and knowledge and understanding to know your word, to trust your word, to believe your word, to live your word perfectly, to love your word and proclaim your word, and even to die for your word, because the Holy Bible is your word, your voice to us. So thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name. Yahweh, Father, Son, Spirit. Well, it's now archived. You can go listen to it, Niles. It was all about Islam. <clears throat> right? It was all about Islam. I think Protestant Believer has a link. Yeah, do hit the like button, folks. So hopefully we're going to begin. And Lord willing, we're going to try to get the software where I can at least schedule my live stream one day in advance to give people ample notice so we can bring more people for the glory of Jesus. Right now, I'm not able to do it. <clears throat> so I will set a schedule now because now I have my own internet. I can now set a set schedule and be on time every day by the grace of Jesus Christ and do this work. So, again, I want to thank you guys. Honestly, I, I don't thank you enough. May the Lord Jesus reward you. Had it not been for your prayers and your fasting and your financial support, I wouldn't be here. So, Lord Jesus, thank you first and foremost. And I thank you that Jesus Christ is working through you to bless me and my children. Thank you. So, pray I can get healthier and holier, right? So God is good all the time. Now, what's missing in my home, and this belongs to Jesus. This home is his. May he sanctify it for his glory. The only thing missing now is my daughters. In Jesus' name, they're coming sooner or later. And pray again this Thursday. God shows up miraculously. The Lord Jesus shows up by his spirit miraculously in Illinois this Thursday because hopefully it will be done and over with. Pray Jesus constrains those evil agents and silences them and rises against them. Keep them away from me. Keep me safe to travel here and everywhere freely. And that the Lord Jesus will bless the support and keep it away from these evil, wicked agents of the devil. So I can use it for my children in Jesus' name. God is answering. And by the way, just to let you know, God answers prayer. Did you watch David Woods? <clears throat> it is, Niles. They're all demons and devils. Did you? Oh, there he goes. Okay, okay, that was the word. Did you watch David Wood's announcement? His brother Manny has been miraculously revived. He's no longer in a coma. If you watch it, you'll start crying. Not only did he come out of the coma, he is fully functional. Right? His speech is slurred, but his brain is working wonderfully well. He understands everything he says. He hears. He's able to respond by nodding and smiling, and he spells out words. So he's fully 
fully alert and he's just smiling, laughing because Jesus Christ is a miracle worker. Jesus Christ is alive. Jesus Rafa in his love and mercy awoke this man from his coma and he's on his way to full recovery. You want to see a miracle? Watch the video. Let me get, in fact, Protestant believer, maybe you can post the link. It will move you to tears how real, how gracious, how kind, how loving and merciful Jesus is. The same Jesus that awoke in that man is the same Jesus who loves us, who's in love with us, and may we be in love with him. And that same Jesus will do a miracle for me and my children. I know he will because we belong to him. Thank you, Jesus. You see how beautiful our God is? I almost started bawling. I was in the car. He is so full of life and a beautiful smile. Right? Beautiful, isn't it? Check it out. And I will promise we'll give you the link. Our Jesus is alive, folks. And I'm not saying he's alive because of miracles and signs and wonders. Even if Jesus didn't do a single sign, miracle, or wonder, Jesus is still alive. Jesus is real. He can heal you now, or he can heal you fully when he returns. But he's alive. He truly lives, folks. He is truly the resurrection life. He loves us, and he's with us. He's in love with us, and I pray by the Spirit we love him, and we are in love with him. Right? We love you, Lord Jesus. So rejoice after we finish this session. Watch that session and just cry out and say, thank you, Lord Jesus. You are so real. Save me from my fears and doubts and my unbelief. Never let me doubt you. <clears throat> so with that said, glory to God, although it's later than normal. I know some of you, it's real late. But guess what? In England, Europe, it's probably 5, 6 in the morning. So we're going to probably get some European viewers because it's early for them. They're awake. Exactly, King of Kings. There was an atheist on the channel. He's like, he was shocked. He was moved by it. He was moved by it, right? King Jesus is alive. Folks, have no doubt Jesus is alive. He is real. He is risen. And we will see him again. Now, I just want to share one thing today, and then we're going to go into our topic. What time is Hey, I don't know what's up, my friend. How did you like that session with William Albrecht? Sorry, folks. <clears throat> Thank you, Nada. She just shared the link if you're going to watch it. All right? Good. So it's early in Australia. Hey, what's up, mate? Now, I want to share something with you. I went to a two-day conference. What's up, Jeremy? What's up, brother? God bless you. I went to a two-day conference, two-day conference on the preservation transmission of the Bible. All right? Can I share something with you guys? I'm not going to mention names, right? I got to hear some of the leading evangelical scholars on the Old and New Testaments, conservative evangelicals. And I can tell you that they presented massive amounts of textual, archaeological, historical data for the veracity, for the preservation of the Old and New Testaments. They actually also discovered some additional Old Testament <clears throat> copies, copies of Old Testament books. Put it this way. If it was based on history, historical facts, if it was based on archaeological facts, if it was based on scientific facts, if it was just based on facts, then the whole world would be Christian because all the facts correctly interpreted, not, tr not brushed aside or ignored or misinterpreted, all the facts correctly interpreted, points to the God of the Bible being God and the creator of all things. Now, I thank God for what I heard. I heard a lot of historical, archaeological, textual data showing me that I can trust the preservation of the Holy Bible and that it is historically accurate. Now, with that said, though, with that said, so there was a lot of meat that blessed me. But remember... You trust the Holy Spirit to guide you into all truth and separate the wheat from the chaff. Let me share some things about these same scholars. Okay, now, I want you to listen carefully. And all glory to the chime God. I'm not trying to boast, but I'm using this to encourage you. Okay, How are you doing, Benjamin? Welcome. I'm using this 
to encourage you to realize you don't need college, you don't need seminary to know the word of God, to know it's been preserved, to know that the God of the Bible is real. What you need is the Holy Spirit, seeking the Holy Spirit, the face of the Holy Spirit, and asking the Spirit to guide you to the right teachers, resources, and open your mind to understand the word and to protect you from error, and he will do it for the glory of Jesus Christ. Okay? Now, I say that because, again, to give God the glory, and may I not come off sounding arrogant, please, Lord, save me from my flesh, my unrighteous anger and patience. Again, I'm going to remind you how amazing the Holy Spirit is. No high school diploma, GD, no college, no seminary, to show you that the Holy Spirit is almighty and he is real and he'll teach you and he'll guide you to the right resources and protect you and correct you in time from all bad theology and sin. Okay. And I'm a witness to that. Here I am in a room where you have professors of colleges and seminaries who've gotten degrees, accredited degrees, PhDs, teaching and influencing the next generation of Christian pastors, theologians, apologists. Let me tell you what happened. A renowned scholar of the Old Testament wrote a commentary on Micah chapter, uh, Micah, the entire book of Micah. Now I asked them, folks, I asked them, how did you translate Micah 5 verse 2? Because <clears throat> if you follow <clears throat> current trend of scholarship, even evangelical scholarship that believes in the Trinity and the inspiration of scripture. They had been affected and influenced by liberal academia. So mm -hmm. sometimes they translate passages in such a way that goes against the tradition. Now, again, if the tradition contradicts truth, God's truth, then discard the tradition. Sorry. Sorry about that. Hey, it's going to buffer. It's going to buffer, right? It's going to buffer. It's going to buffer. We'll see. Okay, sorry about that. Hey, do you see? You can't escape the buffering. It is what it is. But anyway, hopefully it will be a, to a minimum. Now, listen to this. There are traditions that you have no reason to rejecting because they're good traditions and they're faithful to the accurate interpretation of Scripture. But I was curious whether he was impacted by liberal scholarship. So I told him, how did you translate Micah 5 to? Now, so understand and appreciate the point I'm about to make. Let's look at Micah 5, verse 2 in the King James Bible. Okay? He just quoted me. Thank you, brother. But so you don't confuse me, I'll just let Protestant do it. And thank you for your support on Super Chat. Thank you, bro. Okay? Read with me, King James. But thou, Bethlehem, Ephrata, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he, shall he come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel, Whose goings forth, guys pay attention, goings forth, the Hebrew is plural. It's literally plural. Goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. King James, this is the best, and I would say the only accurate interpretation of Micah 5 2, even though scholars will disagree with me. This ruler who comes out of Bethlehem is an eternal figure. He's not simply human, he's an eternal person who comes out of eternity, enters time to become the human ruler of Israel. In other words, this is a clear Old Testament passage to the Messiah being the eternal God who becomes man. Goings forth, his activities, he's been active from the beginning, and he comes out of eternity because he's eternal into time. Okay, Powerful Old Testament witness to the two natures of the Messiah, that he's truly God, truly human. But, No, don't, some translations won't say ancient of days because the word days is not there to put Jesus first. Just follow with me and try to listen more and you'll benefit, I promise you. Let me show you how the NIV renders it. Micah 5.2. Look at how the NIV renders it. Because I want to show you what I learned this weekend. Okay. Micah 5.2 NIV. Watch here. Watch here. When we get an IV, pay, pay, bear with me. Watch here. Just waiting. 
before okay now niv pay attention to difference king james says whose goings forth because the hebrew is plural it is literally plural goings forth have been from old from everlasting but notice niv but you bethlehem ifrata though you are small among the clans of judah out of you will come for me one who will be ruler of israel whose origins are from of old from ancient times Did you catch it? You see this translation? And I've written an extensive article showing you it should be goings forth, not origins, and that he's from everlasting. You see how the NIV translated it in such a way where you no longer see the eternal nature of Israel's ruler. You see that, guys? Everyone see it? His origins are from old, from ancient times. Okay, so I was curious, guys, listen to this. I was curious whether this Old Testament scholar translated it like the NIV. So I asked him, I go, when it comes to Micah 5 2, did you render it as whose origins are from old, from ancient times? He goes, oh, yes. He goes, even though in the fullness of the canon, you can then read it in light of John that it's clearly pointing to Jesus, but in its historical context, it's not referring to the eternity of the Messiah. It's referring to the ancestral origins of the Messiah, meaning his ancestry goes back to Bethlehem because he's from David. All right. With me there? Are you listening? John Doe and everyone else, unless you want to get blocked? That's what he said. So he was saying it's not talking about the eternal existence of the Messiah. It's saying that his ancestral roots are from old because David was from Bethlehem and it's showing that his ancestry is old, it's ancient because he comes from David's line and it goes way back. In other words, it's not talking about the eternal nature of the Messiah, but it's talking about his human genealogy. Okay, you with me there? Why don't you listen now? An outstanding Old Testament professor who reads and writes Hebrew the way you read and write English. Send John Doe to his mother Send him back to his dog cage, his filthy dog. Okay. Are you with me there? Okay. You want to hear how he responded? Riaz, you see what you did? You unhid him. Hide him, Riaz, please, before I lay hands on you. Okay. Now watch here. You know what he told me? I said, okay, can I ask you a question? He goes, sure. I'll go, here's my question to you. If it's talking about his origin, his ancestral origins, why is it in the plural? Because it's plural, goings forth. If it's talking about his ancestry, why does it say whose origin is from old? Why is it in the plural if it's talking about his ancestry? Do you guys you want to know his reaction? Now, this is a scholar, man, who <laughs> teaches seminary. You know what his reaction was? He goes, man, that's a good question. I never thought about it. I'm not lying to you. The Lord is listening. That's a good question. I never thought about it. And he paused there like he was shocked. He goes, maybe it's an intensive plural. Maybe that's the reason. He goes, well, man, that's a good question. He was shocked. Folks. These are the professors who are teaching the next generation of Christians. What, what kind of Christians do you think they're going to produce? Sorry for the noise in the back. Muhammad and his followers are barking. Okay. But now it's going to get a little worse. Are you ready? It's going to get a little worse. Now watch here. <clears throat> I went to a breakout session. This young man was younger than me. I'm 47. He too teaches on the seminary level, and he's considered one of the up-and-coming scholars of the textual transmission of the New Testament. He contributed an article to a book that just came out on the text of the New Testament, its transmission. Okay, So he's now the next generation who's going to replace the Dan Wallace, when it comes to the text of the New Testament. So his talk was on the original books, what we call the autographa, the autographs. 
you know, what is an autograph? So he explained that and he talked about some of the variant readings. In his talk, he was mentioning the variant readings. Now, guys, let me give you the story because I was very sad for him. Humble young man, loves Jesus, but you can see, you can see that this man's fire and passion has gone out. Yet a humble man who loves Jesus. But let me tell you what happened. He mentioned that you have manuscripts, the two oldest cop, uh, Greek <clears throat> manuscripts of Mark that has Mark 16 don't include verses 9 and 10. And he means Codex Vaticanus and Codex Sinaiticus or Sinaiticus. He says, so the oldest Greek witnesses to Mark 16 don't have verses 9 and 10. Now, by oldest, he means, again, let me repeat the names, Codex Vaticanus, Codex Sinaiticus, Sin Sinaiticus, which are dated to the 4th century, around 350 AD. But then he says, however, on the other hand, Irenaeus, Irenaeus writing in 180 AD, 180 AD, so this quotation is older than Vaticanus and Sinaiticus, because he's writing in 100 AD, and he's writing in Lyons, France. He's the bishop of France, a disciple of Polycarp, who's a disciple of the Apostle John. So understand who Irenaeus, Irenaeus is. And he says, Irenaeus quotes Mark 16, verse 19, the longer ending, and says Mark wrote it. So understand what you have here. You have Irenaeus writing in 180 AD. Bishop of France, who died as a martyr for Jesus, that's how much he loved the Lord Jesus, a disciple of Polycarp, who also died as a martyr for Jesus, was burned alive, and Polycarp is the disciple of John, the apostle. So notice his pedigree. He was discipled and taught by the very disciple of the apostle John. And in his writing, he mentions that as a young man, he saw the apostle John when he was young. Amazing, right? And he says, in his copy of Mark, he found Mark 16, 9 to 20, because he quotes Mark 16, 19, and he says, Mark wrote this. So now he opens up Q&A. Q &A. I raised my hand. I said, sir, I'm kind of baffled. Watch this. Watch this. I go, I'm kind of baffled with the church fathers. I go, here we are appealing to Irenaeus who quoted Mark 16, 1619 as coming from Mark. He says Mark wrote, and he quotes Mark 16, 19. And yet scholars say that Irenaeus is wrong. Now notice what I said here. God here. Listen to this. I said, however, Irenaeus is our oldest extent witness. There may have been witnesses before him, but we don't have their writings. He's the oldest witness to the authorship of the Gospels. He is the oldest source we have that Matthew wrote Matthew, Mark wrote Mark, Luke wrote Luke, John wrote John, and also our oldest witness to John writing Revelation, the same apostle who wrote Gospel. I go, now, sir, I hear I'm confused. If you're going to tell me Irenaeus is wrong about Mark 16, 19, then how are you going to tell me we can trust him when it comes to who wrote the Gospels? If he's wrong about the longer ending of Mark, then who's to say he's not wrong about who wrote Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? And yet the scholars appeal to Irenaeus to tell us who wrote the Gospels, but when it comes to Mark 16, verse 19, now he's wrong. So then how do we trust him? Do you guys want to hear his reaction? Remember, these guys are professors. They got PhDs. They're writing books. They're the ones who are going to teach the next generation of pastors and theologians. You know what he said? I'm not lying to you. He goes, a very good question. I don't know how to answer that. And you make a strong case that the longer ending of Mark must be genuine. Catch it? He said that a whole room full of people. You know who was there to hear it? Ask him. El Fadi. El Fadi? the one that I do the shows with on Sierra International, he was there and he was amazed and even told his wife, you see the questions that Sam's asking? 
He was there. You can ask him. And I'm not boasting of myself. May God purify my heart motives. Lord Jesus, please save me from my corrupt motives. Okay. He said it. He goes, good question. I don't know how to answer that. And that makes a strong case for the longer ending of Mark being genuine. But then he mentioned another thing. Are you ready? He mentioned the fact that Irenaeus says in his writing, and Irenaeus says, there are heretics among us, heretics among us, who have been corrupting the copies of these inspired books that we receive from the apostles. Okay? And some of them have changed the number of the beast in Revelation 13, 18 to 6, 16. Irenaeus mentions that. There are defective copies produced by heretics where they change 666 to 616. But then Irenaeus says, but we know the true reading. It's 666 because we have copies approved in our possession from the apostles. He says that in his writing. So, folks, did you hear what he said? Irenaeus, who's changing the number from 666 to 616? The heretics. How do you know? Because we have accurate copies in our possession that we receive from the apostles and their successors. Okay, now, I mentioned this, and you know what's ironic? I mentioned this yesterday in the session, and in today's session, and you can listen to previous sessions by Dan Wallace because he makes the same presentation everywhere he goes. I said, Professor Wallace, who's going to be speaking tomorrow, remember, this is yesterday, last night, so he spoke today, Saturday. So last night I said he's, he's going to speak tomorrow, and I even told him he's going to bring this up, and the Lord bears witness he brought it up. He brought it up today in today's session. Dan Wallace says the oldest copy of Revelation that we found, the oldest copy, which is later than Irenaeus, by the way, reads in Revelation 13, 18, 666. And he goes, another copy that was found also reads six. No, I'm sorry. The oldest copy of Revelation 13, 18 that they found reads 616, 616. And he goes, another copy that was discovered also reads 616. 616. And Dan Wallace said it today. He said it today in today's session, and he says it in other sessions. He said he's tempted to go back and then revise the NET because he was one of the editors on the New English Translation and change 666 to 616 because he's persuaded that the manuscript evidence lends support that this is the original reading. And then he said today, you know, I really don't know, but he did say I don't know, is it 666, 616? But in light of these, he would change it to 616. Okay. I don't want to misrepresent him. I asked him the question. I go, Daniel Wallace says these two witnesses, the oldest copy in Revelation and this other one, the old, oldest witnesses on the number of the beasts are 616. But, sir, can you help me understand why is Daniel Wallace going with the manuscript evidence when Irenaeus tells us that it is defective copies by heretics corrupting the reading to 616, so that Irenaeus already told us that these copies are produced by heretics, they don't come from Orthodox Christians producing good copies of Revelation, because he says that it was the heretics who were corrupting the copies of Revelation to read 616, then why is it Daniel Wallace is telling us about these two copies when Irenaeus already told us 616 are from heretics. So why do we look to those copies and not take what Irenaeus says into consideration? Do you know what he said? Do you know what he said? Good question. I honestly don't know the answer. I don't know how to answer that. I honestly don't know how to answer that. He said that. I'm not lying to you. And then he saw me today in the morning. Was it today? Hold on. Yes, today in the morning. Vocab Malone is a witness to this. He came up to me. He shook my hand. He goes, your questions were so good. Thank you for those questions. They're very good. And you know what he told me? He told me, I'm open to where the evidence leads. So if the evidence shows that Mark 16, 9 to 20 is genuine, I'll accept it. So what he told me, not lying to you. But here's where he broke my heart. 
here's where he broke my heart. In his talk yesterday, in one of the Q&A, he said, as he studied textual criticism, he became filled with doubts about the transmission of the Bible. He started doubting whether the Bible is preserved. Then he said, as I continued studying, many of those doubts have been removed. Many of those doubts have been removed. Notice what he did not say. He didn't say all of it. So today I asked him, I go, do you still have doubts? He goes, yes, there are some doubts, and I don't think I'll ever find answers to them, but that's how it is. That's just the nature of the evidence. What do you take away from this, folks? There are pluses, there are minuses in going to college and seminary. But in my view, in my view, the minuses, the negatives outweigh any good you'll get from going to seminary and college. You go into a college or seminary on fire and you come out dead and passionless. And if I could take a picture of him, he looked like he had a weight on his shoulders. The passion was gone. The fire was gone. In fact, from all the speakers, you didn't see any passion or fire. Very dry, very boring, very monotone. There, there it goes. Right? Jeremy, Jeremy, you know how you get that passion back? Cry out to the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, ignite my heart with passion for the Lord Jesus. Set my heart ablaze on fire for Jesus. And now by faith, because I'm not going to have all the answers. Well, you can't. You're not God. You can't know everything. But I'm going to take a step of faith, and I'm going to trust that what I have are the perfect words of God in my language. I don't care what academia says, and I'm going to preach them as thus saith the Lord. Yes, you can, because the Holy Spirit can reignite your heart. The problem, however, is... You won't get the respect of the academy. You won't get invited to sem uh, seminars. And you won't be invited to teach in their institutions. You get my point? So you're going to have to decide. Do I care whether ac the academy, academia will respect me? Do I care whether I'm going to have a teaching position? Do I care whether I'm going to inv get invited to their conferences and seminars? So, you know. Or I'm going to trust God and do the ministry and believe God will stir up people who are like-minded, who will come and support me prayerfully and financially. Matthew, if all you're going to learn is Hebrew and Greek and that's it, go ahead. Go to the seminary, learn Hebrew and Greek. But if you're going to go and take more sessions, I would discourage you from doing so. A Protestant believer, the seminaries are becoming more worldly and liberal because they've opened a door to allow the enemy to sneak in stealthily, not willingly or willfully, but in their, <clears throat> what's the word I'm looking for? In their slumber and sleep and in trying to earn the respect of academia, liberal scholarship, they've now made a lot of concessions where now Satan is coming in slowly and like Paul said, get rid of the leaven because a little leaven will spread and corrupt the whole batch. They allowed a little leaven to come in. It's now permeating and spreading and destroying our institutions. Are destroying our institutions. Let these two true testimonies. I'm not lying. I'm not exaggerating. May the Lord Jesus sanctify me and purify me not to do it for the praise of men. Let these two testimonies encourage you. Folks, trust me. You don't need college seminary. God has given you a resource called the Internet. And on this Internet, he's given you YouTube channels, websites by men and women of God who, by the Holy Spirit, <clears throat> are sold out for the Word of God and affirm the Word of God and the core doctrines of Christian faith and can present it to you in a way that makes sense so you can learn the arguments, absorb the arguments, 
and then proclaim them for the glory of Jesus. Honestly, trust me when I say you don't need it. Trust me. You will be disappointed. In fact, if vocab is here. When I go on a live stream, I'll ask vocab to confirm this. These scholars were so disconnected with the common person, they spoke above the heads of everyone. Unless you were in seminary and learned, understood the, ling the, the language, they lost the crowd. They couldn't connect with the crowd because they're in their seminaries dealing with scholars, right? They're not able to connect with the crowds anymore. Sal John, I don't know if you're here. Are you agreeing with me or your channel? I, I don't get understand, Sal John. When you say Holy Spirit is faster than the internet, more accurate, what does that got to do with the Holy Spirit using the internet to bring you to, to a higher level? I thought, I'm, I'm assuming you're a regular and you're on the same page with me. Okay. But anyway, be that as it may, be that as it may, I just wanted to share it with you to encourage you as well as to safeguard you. No, they need to reach the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit that you need to cry out to and whose face you need to see and ask him to fill you, and then he'll guide you to the right teachers. Folks, let this encourage you. Let me encourage you in another way. Let me give you this advice. Go to college or go to university to get a degree in a secular field, maybe become a doctor or a lawyer or whatever, right? But don't go to college and seminary for a Bible education. If you want, go get a degree in a secular field so you have something to fall on or so that you can then enter the secular field as a Christian witness, become a doctor so that when you're in a hospital, you can preach Jesus Christ and pray for people, right? Or become a lawyer so that you can be a godly influence in a corrupt legal satanic system and influence others for the glory of Jesus. That you can do, but don't go to college or university seminary for a Bible education. You're going to go in on fire, come out dead and passionless. The guys there, honestly, it was sickening to see it. No passion, no fire, man, no, no confidence. And they don't even see it. They don't even see that the way they speak. I wish you were there to see sissified, sissified, feminized men. No passion, no boldness, no war, no warrior spirit, spirit like the apostles and the prophets. Right? If I could go back... In other words, if the Lord were to take me back as a young man, 19, and I was going to go to school, I would go to school to get a degree, let's say become a doctor or a lawyer or an IT guy, so I can have something to fall on to make money so that I wouldn't be at the mercy of people. You get my, my point? The only setback, drawback from being an apologist is you depend on the people of God being stirred up by the grace of God to support you, and that can tempt you to then take shortcuts and compromise in order not to offend donors who will stop supporting you. This is why you need to pray for us that Jesus Christ by his spirit will never allow ourselves to whore ourselves and prostitute ourselves for money. Never in Jesus name may we prostitute ourselves for money. Never in Jesus name. Because I can tell you that some of the people there didn't want their names to be mentioned on our videos because they were afraid of the drawback, the backlash. Do you know what some of these apologists and scholars, not apologists, do you know what some of the scholars, professors have said to David Wood? I'm not going to mention their names. You know what they've told David Wood? They told David Wood, we admire you for what you're doing, and we praise God for what you're doing. We're behind you, but we can't do what you do. Because they know if they do what David does, they'll be fired. Now, do you really respect these men? They've told David Wood, we admire what you do, and we back you up, and we thank God for you, but we can't do it. You know why they can't do it? The backlash. They'll be fired. And I'm if I tell you who they are, you'll be shocked. But I can't. I won't because I don't want David to get angry at me. I don't want the Lord to be angry with me to think that I'm vilifying them, right? Demonizing them. You'll be shocked who they are. 
This is the problem with the church in America today in the West. People have to toe the line if they don't want to get fired from the seminary or lose their position in an apologetics organization. This is why the route to take is the route that David is taking, I'm taking, Vogap's taking, independent apologetic ministries, not tied with any organization, lest we have to <clears throat> jump through hoops and say, yes, boss, yes, boss, in order to get supported. Yep, Freddie, they can. So can you now be more intentional in covenanting with us by now praying even harder for us and even fasting for us and asking your churches to pray and fast for us, that God will preserve us, provide for us, that we never prostitute ourselves for money or fame, but God will keep us men and women of integrity Glorifying Jesus to the point of death. Please, because we're not better than these men and women who have compromised and they don't think they're compromising. We're not better than them. Okay, now with that said, are we ready? Right? That's why many people say seminary is cemetery. Okay, and Daryl Nutt, don't leave. I want to answer John 17, 21. Though I've answered in previous sessions articles, do remind me to answer it today. Okay, Daryl? Now, may the Father, Son, Holy Spirit be glorified through us. May the Spirit anoint this session and save me from error to glorify Jesus Christ. Now, John 1 and the death of Christ, because you asked me to discuss how the prologue of John. The prologue is John chapter 1, verses 1 to 18. That's called the prologue. Remember what I said in yesterday's session? I'm going to repeat it. By inspiration of the Holy Spirit, John wrote, John chapter 1, verses 1 to 18. This is where I need you to now pay attention. John wrote, John chapter 1, verses 1 to 18. By inspiration of the Holy Spirit, obviously. As the lens through which you are to interpret the rest of the gospel. John is saying, here is the lens the Holy Spirit has given me to give to you that you need to put on to now understand my gospel, written by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, correctly. Because this lens will help you to see my gospel the way God wants you to see it. And since God is a God of truth, when you see it from God's perspective, you're going to see clearly, perfectly. You understand what the prologue is meant to do? Right? Everyone with me? Oh. Guys, you want to be shocked? You want to be shocked? You want to know that God is answering your prayers and that Jesus is moving on the heart of my ex-wife? Can I now share with you because you're my family and I love you? You want to see how real Jesus is, how much he loves us? That just like he awoke Manny's brother from the coma and he's on his way to full recovery, I just got a text message from my ex-wife on my daughter's phone, even though I told her, do not text me. You want to hear what she said? You want to talk about God is answering your prayers? You guys want to be blown away? Because I'm blown away. Right now, I just got it. Guys, I'm about to cry because of how much Jesus loves us. He's answering you when you pray for me. You guys now want to hear? You want to hear? Okay. Girls are sleeping because I sent them a bunch of my pictures from today's conference. Girls are sleeping. We had an early day because of Zippy's piano recital. My baby. That now watch how God is answering you guys for her, that he's convicting her. Send the video tomorrow so you can see. I will send you the video tomorrow you can see. She sent me now. She's going to send me the video. You look good, Sam. I have not heard her ever say that to me. You look good, Sam. Have a blessed night. She's never said that to me. Have a blessed night. Please send me some pictures of them when they were babies. They were all on your old computer. I want to make a collage for Sarai's birthday. Folks, I'm about to cry. Okay? Okay? Honestly, I'm moved right now. Let me repeat. Okay? Man, I'm, on, I'm, I'm moved right now. Because this is live, I'm moved, man. Wow. Folks, I haven't heard her say this to me. He goes, you look good, Sam. Have a blessed night. I'm about to cry because she's never blessed me. 
She's never blessed me, folks. Honestly, I'm holding back tears right now. <laughs> Guys, you see how amazing Jesus is? You see how much Jesus loves us and he's doing miracles because you're praying for me? And guys, I just want to say again, I really love you guys. I love you because you've stood with me even though I'm imperfect and I have issues and I've disappointed you. I love you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for loving me for the sake of Jesus and praying for me. Folks, I haven't heard that woman say that to me. I haven't heard that woman say that. Say, I'm about to cry, man. Honestly, you know what I've heard her say to me? You know what I've heard? I'm not attracted to you. I've never loved you. And I'll never be attracted to you. And I'll never love you. You are a hypocrite. You need to be exposed. And I'm sick of tiring of people saying beauty and the beast, that I'm beautiful and I'm with you a beast. <laughs> Man, I'm bad, dude. Thank you, Lord. <clears throat> Sorry, guys. Touch me. Because that was a message from a broken woman. That was a message from a woman broken, and she realizes what she has done. And so now God in his love for her, because remember I said Jesus loves her. Her name is Michelle Gabriel. Jesus loves her. Doesn't matter what she did to me, what I've done to her. I'm nothing. I'm irrelevant. Jesus loves her, and he died to save her. So ask Jesus <clears throat> to bring her to his feet and to save her. Because at the end of the day, she's still the mother of my daughters. Okay? I wish I can hug every one of you, and I can kiss every one of you. Do you know why? Your prayers are being heard by Jesus Christ is answering your prayers for me and my daughters. I love you guys, man. I, I'm really sorry. This really uh, rocked me. It's really rocked me. I'm sorry. Anyway. Thank you, Lord. <clears throat> Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Thank you. I love you, Lord. All right. Okay, now uh, let's come back. I'm still stunned, man. I am stunned. I'm really stunned, folks. See, this is the problem doing live streams. You don't know what's going to hit you, right? <clears throat> I'm stunned. <clears throat> These are tears of love because how much I love Jesus, how much he loves us. Folks, do you need more miracles? What else do you guys want? What more can Jesus do to show you he's real and he loves you? Go see the video of Manny, David Wood's brother, miraculously awoken, awoken from his coma. <clears throat> and another sign that he loves me and my daughters. Please pray for her, okay? Pray for her, Michelle Gabriel, my ex. Pray for her. Jesus brings her to the feet of Jesus, her Lord. Heals her, changes her, and she repents. And pray that Jesus Christ, my Lord, will remove Martin Simon Yako, that man. Pray that she's no longer with him, and he's removed from my daughter's lives. He's answering you, folks. Okay? Okay. Now, with that said, can we begin? Wow, you guys, man. Can we begin? Woo. All righty then. All right. Alex, you got to go back and listen to the beginning. All right. To regroup and focus, regroup and focus. Okay. The prologue. Thank you, Carly. God bless you. Thank you, all of you. All of you that are contributing. The prologue, John 1 verses 118, is the lens that the Holy Spirit wants you to put on to understand John correctly. Everyone with me there? John 1 verses 118 is given by inspiration of the Holy Spirit for you to now read the rest of the gospel in light of that section. Anything in the gospel that you read 
and interpret in such a way that contradicts John 1 verse 118, you are misreading the gospel. Is that clear? Was that clear? Is that clear? Not a, it is miraculous. You understand, right? It is my own place, Lopez. God bless you, brother. Sorry, Lopez. I've been busy. I don't mean to ignore you. I'm going to have to give you my number to contact you. Okay. Now, everyone got that, right? Now, one of the best books written on the Trinity to introduce people to the Trinity, this book I recommend for beginners and intermediate level uh, students of the word. The Forgotten Trinity, the updated version by Dr. James R. White. Okay. This is the updated version. This is what the older version looks like. Okay. Get this book. This is the older version. Right. Okay. So everyone with me? Let me read what he says about the prologue. Are you ready? John 1, verses 1 to 18. In the updated version, write down the page numbers, pages 44 and 103. Pages 44 and 103, okay? In the updated version. In the updated version, it's pages 44 and 103. Write this down. In the older version, if you have it, some of you have it, the older version, it's pages 48 and 104. Pages 48 and 104. That's the older version. Write them down. Here's what he says about the prologue. Are you ready? Guys, again, I want to just say I love you. I love all of you because of Jesus. And I know you'll agree with me and amen. We love you, Lord Jesus. We're in love with you. We love you, son of God, how amazing you are. You make grown men cry, right? I've never cried as much in my life than I have now worshiping Jesus. He makes grown men cry. Okay, now, what does he say about the prologue? Here you go. Ready? What does he say? And all evangelical Trinitarian scholars will agree with this. It's not just him. Okay, you ready? In the updated version. Few passages of Scripture are more important to our study of the Trinity, and in particular of the person of the Son, than the prologue of John. Did you catch it? The prologue. When prologue means John 1, verses 118. Let me read it again. Few passages of Scripture are more important to our study of the Trinity, and in particular of the person of the Son, than the prologue of John. You see, John clearly intended this passage to function as a lens. You know, I didn't make it up. As a lens. A window of sorts through which we are to read the rest of his gospel. If we stumble here, in other words, if we misunderstand the prologue, misinterpret it, we are in danger of missing so much of the richness that is to be found in the rest of the book. But if we work hard to grasp John's meaning here, many other passages will open up for us of their own accord, yielding tremendous insights into the heart of God's revelation of himself in Jesus Christ. That was page 44 of the updated version. Now let's read page 103, okay? Page 103, right here. <clears throat> 103. We have asserted that John intends the entire gospel to be read through the interpretive window of the prologue of 1 verses 118. Let me repeat. We have asserted that John intends the entire gospel to be read through the interpretive window of the prologue of chapter 1, verses 1 to 18. Clear? Did everyone get it? And it's not James White's opinion or my opinion. This is the position of evangelical Trinitarian scholars and anyone who believes the inspiration of John. John 1, verses 118, you got to read the gospel through those verses and any passage you inter interpret to contradict John 1 verses 118 you are misreading that passage misinterpreting it if you got it we can now move on if you got it we can now move on you everyone getting it why is this not happening here I guess we're buffering seems like we're buffering but I hope not Exactly, Lana Z. I agree with you. But unfortunately, we have people that are there. I thank God I don't belong to a seminary, and I'm not part of an organization. Folks, if I was, I wouldn't have the freedom to do what I'm doing. In fact, they would throw me out and fire me. But hey, 
Jesus, we serve him and his organization. Now, with that said, how does John 1 show that Jesus Christ, our Lord, died for every human creature? Right? How does John 1, verses 118, show that Jesus Christ died to procure the redemption, salvation for every human creature? You ready now for the evidence? Hope the picture is clear. Are you guys ready for the evidence? Okay, who's ready now? Are you in the saddle paying attention? All right, let's go. Number one, I want you to pay attention to this detail. Folks, no side discussion, no fighting, no arguing. Please focus. Okay. Number one, I want you to remember the following. Okay, we got Rhett Quigley, a filthy dog of the devil, whose mother needs to be arrested for giving birth to a rabid dog. Send this guy to Asheron. It's a wicked dog. Gives Catholics a bad name. Let's focus in Jesus' name. Pay attention now. In John 1, verses 118, you're going to discover the following themes. Guys, if you don't pay attention, you're, I'm going to lose you. If you don't be, pay attention, I'm going to lose you. Pay attention. Okay? John 1, verses 118. Okay. In John 1, you're going to find Jesus is the light. He's the true light sent into the world to shine in the darkness, and the darkness cannot overcome it. Part of the prologue mentions John the Baptist being sent to testify to Jesus being that light, the true light that lightens every man that shines in the darkness of the world. That's all John 1, verses 1, all the way to 10. I just gave you that. It also says, that those who believe in Jesus will be born of God. Let's look at John 1, 12 to 13. John 1, 12 to 13. Now follow with me. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of God, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So notice, John 1, 12, 13 talks about being born of God. Pay attention. So John 1, verses 118, you have, G you have John, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, talking about you got to be born of God. Jesus is the light, the true light that shines in the darkness. Darkness cannot overcome it. He's the true light that entered the world. He entered the world. John the Baptist sent to testify about Jesus, right? So you got that? You got that? I want to make sure you get it. I don't want to be boring, but I want you to understand Every one of those themes in John 1 are picked up in John 3. John 3, that entire chapter, <laughs> refers to and unpacks all these themes of the prologue. John 3 echoes John 1, and that like John 1, John 3 talks about being born of God, born again. John 3 talks about the witness of John the Baptist. John 3 talks about Jesus being the light that shines into the world, right? Shines into the world, shines in the world, into the world in order to destroy the darkness that has engulfed the world. So John 3 basically refers to, mentions, and unpacks all the themes mentioned in John 1 verses 118. Now let me unpack it for you, see where I'm going with this. We already saw John 1 13, born of God, right? Let's go to John 3 verses 3 to 8. John 3 verses 3 to 8. John 3, verses 3 to 8. Being born of God. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I said unto you, Except a man be born again. Born of God. Born again. Same theme. He cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? And by the way, I did an exposition on what this means, water and spirit. In one of my previous sessions, I think over a year ago, God willing. But if you want me to do another exposition on this, I will in the future, God willing. So don't ask me what it means to be born of water and spirit. Let's focus on the theme for tonight. All right? How can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I said to thee, except a man be born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Okay? 
<laughs> that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. So born of God, born of spirit, born again, born of water and spirit. Same theme of John 1, 12 to 13, okay? Marvel not, then I said unto thee, you must be born again. The wind bloweth where it list, listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh, and whither it goeth, so is every one that is born of the Spirit. You got it here? One theme of John 1, 12, 13 is to be born of God. That theme is mentioned in John 3. Born of God, born of the Spirit, born of water and Spirit. Okay, let's look at another theme. Mentioned in the prologue, picked up by John in John 3. Let's go to John 1 and read verses 4 and 5. John 1, 4 and 5. And then John 1, verse 9. John 1, 4 and 5 and John 1, verse 9. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended not. That was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Did you catch it? Light, darkness. The light entered the world, a world engulfed in darkness, to destroy the darkness to set people free. Okay. Now, does John 3 mention it? Does John 3 mention this theme of light coming into the world to destroy the darkness and set people free from darkness? Let's go to John 3, 19 to 21. John 3, 19 to 21. John 3, 19 to 21. And this is the condemnation that light is come into the world. Sound familiar? Light has come into the world. And men love darkness rather than light. Sound familiar? Because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. So let's look at John 3, 19 and John 1, 9, back to back. John 3, 19, John 1, 9, back to back. John 3, 19. And this is the condition that light is come into the world. John 1, 9. And that was the true light cometh into the world. Do you see that? Another theme mentioned in the prologue picked up by John 3. And I hope it's blowing your mind away. Now, by the power of the Holy Spirit, he's now opening our eyes, illuminating us to see how deep the gospel is. It's like, wow, that's always been there, but I didn't see it. Now, aren't you thankful to the trying God? And aren't you thankful to the Holy Spirit for raising up teachers to help you see it? Thank you, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Thank you. Okay, now, another theme. John the Baptist sent as a witness. Let's read John 1, 6 to 8. John 1, 6 to 8. What a glorious day today. Thank you, Lord. Yep. John 1, 3, 6 to 8. There was, not John 1, 3. What did I say John 1, 3? John 1, 6 to 8. Forget the 3. I don't know why I said that. John 1, 6 to 8. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light, that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. Okay, so now we have the theme of John bearing witness to the light, who is Jesus. Is that picked up in John 3? Let's go to John 3, 22 to 31. John 3, 22 to 31. Watch here where we're going to go with this. After these things came Jesus and his disciples into the land of Judea, and there he tarried with them and baptized. And John also was baptizing in Anan near to Salem. Because there was much water there, and they came and were baptized, for John was not yet cast into prison. Then arose a question between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purifying. And they came unto John and said unto him, Rabbi, he that was with thee beyond Jordan, to whom thou bearest witness, Behold, the same baptizeth, and all men come to him. John, the one you bore witness to. Well, that's what John 1, 6 said. He's not the light, but he came to bear witness to the light. John, you are that one who came to bear witness about that Jesus. Hmm. Now notice 27. John answered and said, A man can receive nothing except it be given to him from heaven. 
Ye yourselves bear witness me, bear wit bear me witness, wow, Shakespearean English, that I said, I am not the Christ, but that I am sent before him. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This my joy, therefore, is fulfilled. I'm just the friend of the bridegroom. Jesus is the bridegroom. I came to prepare people and point people to him. And I'm happy he's here. My mission's complete. He must increase, but I must decrease. He that cometh from above is above all. He that is of the earth is earthly. I'm from the earth. I'm earthly. He's from above, so he's above all of us. And, he, and speaking of the earth, he that cometh from heaven is above all. Now, did you see the other theme of John 1 and John 3? Did you see the pattern? John 1 mentions John the Baptist sent to prepare for Jesus. John 3 mentions the same thing. John 1 mentions that Jesus is a light, the true light that shines in the darkness. John 3 mentions the light that enters the world to overcome the darkness. John 1, 9 says the true light entered the world. John 3, 19 says the light entered the world. John 1, 12, 13 says you must be born of God. John 3 mentions being born of the spirit, born again, born of water and spirit. Do you see all the themes in John 1 or in John 3? Do you see it? You sure you're catching it? Because now you're going to get blown away. You sure you're catching it? Okay. John 1.10 and 1.14. Exactly, Cloudy. G. I like that. John 1.10 and verse 14. 1, 10, and 14. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. Pay attention now. He came into the world that he created, and the world did not recognize him as its creator. But now watch. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as the only begotten of the Father, Managaneos, Managaneos, glory of the Father, the begot only begotten of the Father. And then John 1, 18, let's watch this. John 1, 18. Now you watch where I'm going to go. These, these were some of the passages that convinced me I can't hold to particular redemption. I don't mean to offend my Calvinist brothers who will <clears throat> say I was wrong and say I'm misinterpreting. That's fine. Okay, now watch here, John 1, 18. No man hath seen God any time, the only begotten Son. Monogenes, we use. Or you want to say we us. Monogenes, we use. Guys, pay attention. John 1.10, 1.14, 1, 1 18 mentions Jesus entering the world that he created. Mentions he is the monogenes, we use, we us. The monogenes of the Father, monogenes, only begotten of the Father, only begotten Son. The, th this theme that Jesus is the only begotten of the Father, only begotten Son who entered the world is also picked up in John 3. John 3, 16-18. No, it doesn't say Jewish world. Don't add to the text or I'll bust your face and repent later. John 3, 16, 18. This theme of Jesus being the only begotten of the Father, only begotten Son, monogenes, we use, entering the world, picked up in John 3, 16, 18. Read with me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. There's that word begotten again. Monogenes, begotten and then son, we us, we us. And this only begotten son came into what? The world. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Hmm. Do you see that all the themes in the prologue are mentioned in John 3? You guys catch it, right? All the themes in John 1, verses 118, are picked up, mentioned in John 3. John 3, verses 1, all the way to 36. That entire chapter picks up all the themes in John 1. 
Yep, Marcy, I'm on my new house. Make sure to hear this from the beginning later, Marcy. And by the way, Marcy, did you listen to the two previous sessions? If so, I pray they bless you. Okay. Did everyone see it? All the themes of John 1 picked up in John 3, the entire chapter, verses 1 to 36. If you saw it, now here is where the fun begins. Now, let's put John 3, verses 16 to 17, with John 1, 10, and 14. Let's see if you catch it. Watch here. John 1, 10 and 14. Watch here. John 3, 16, 17. Pay attention language. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten, Managanese, son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world. Sent into the world. for To do what? Not to condemn it, but that the world might be saved through him. Now watch the theme. He was in the world. God sent his only begotten son into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. Whom did God send into the world? His only begotten son. John 1, 14. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father. Folks, I hope the light switch goes on by the power of the Holy Spirit. John 1 tells us Jesus came into the world as the only begotten of the Father, what world? The world that he created. Folks, when it says that Jesus entered the world that he created and the world failed to recognize its creator, that Jesus is the creator of the world. Is there anything in that term world that is excluded from being created by Jesus? When it says he entered the world that he created, isn't that every human being? He was in the world, and though, though the world was made through him. What does that exclude? It says the world was made through him. The world came into existence through him. He brought the world into existence. Now here it's not talking about all creation. It's talking about the earth and humankind that live on the earth. Here the world means humankind that live on the earth. Is there anyone excluded? When it says he entered the world, he came into this world that he brought into being, Who's excluded from that? He entered the world that he created and brought into being. Who's excluded? It's not about the world of mankind, human beings. Anyone excluded or is that all human beings? Can anyone say that John 1.10 doesn't mean all of mankind? Because here world means humanity, humankind that inhabit the earth. He came to all humankind. All humankind that he made. Includes everyone, right? Hold on. Remember what scholars like James White said. How am I to interpret John 3? I am to interpret John 3 in light of what? The prologue, right? The prologue is the lens through which I am interpret all of the gospel, including John 3, right? Right? Correct? But hold on, if I now interpret John 3, 16, 17, light of John 1, that means the world that Jesus entered into, the world that he came to save, has to be understood as a statement about all humanity. Jesus came to save the whole human race. Let's look at John 3, 16, 17, in light of the prologue. Read. Now let's see if you get it. For God so loved the world. What world? The world that he created. John 1.10. Because I'm supposed to interpret this in light of the prologue, right? I'm supposed to interpret this in light of John 1 verse 118. That's what they're telling me. That's what even our brother James White says. All right. That's what I'm going to do now. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but the world through him might be saved. Wait, 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 wait. If I'm to interpret John 3, 16, 17, light of John 1, John 1 says 
The world he came into is the world that he created. That means all humanity, no one's excluded. But then John 3 says, the reason why he came into that world was to save the world. What world? The world that he created. Is there anything part of the world he didn't create? No, he created all. So that means he came into the world of humanity to save all humankind because all humankind was created by him. How do you get around it? How do you, how do you avoid that now? I want it to sink in what I just said. If I am to interpret John 3 in light of the prologue, but John 1, the prologue tells me, the world that the true light entered into is the world that he created, brought into being. And then John 3 tells me the purpose why he came into the world, to save that world that he created. So the world of humanity that he created, he comes now to save it from its darkness. Who is excluded? And then this is repeated again in John 12, 47. This is why, and I don't say this to be disrespectful. You will not find, at least I haven't found. I may be wrong. Maybe he'll listen to this and then he'll just sit on his dividing line. You will not find John, James White explaining John 3 in light of the prologue. Every time he's addressed it, as far as I recall, he may have done it. He may have said something, written something. I, I haven't heard all the DLs, and I haven't read everything he's written. But all the times that I heard him address John 3, he never appeals to John 1 to explain John 3. And if any man hear my words and believe not, I judge him not. For I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. Okay, hold on. Evangelical Trinitarian scholars like James White tells me, all of God, the Gospel of John, all of John must be interpreted in light of John 1, verses 118. So, Lord Jesus, I want to know, this world that you came to save, what world are you referring to? Go back to John 1, verses 9 and 10. Okay, let's go back to John 1, verses 9 and 10. All right, let's see it again. So you, Son of God, came not to condemn the world, but to save the world. Okay, what world did you come to save? That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made up by him. So you came to save the world that you created, that you made, that you brought into being. But that doesn't exclude anyone, because you made everyone in the world. You made all of humanity. No one's excluded. So if you came into the world that you brought into being, meaning the world of humankind, where humanity inhabits, you came to the world because that's where human beings live for the purpose of saving that world because that's the world that you created. That includes everyone because everyone was created by you. No one's excluded. Then that means John's prologue is telling me that you, son of God, came to save all of humanity. Exactly. How do you get around it? I don't know, Patrick. How do you get around it? Yes, he did. Angela, I hope you're trying to set me up because it's going to backfire on you. Jesus did accomplish redemption. Yes, he did, Angela. What's your counter response? Because I used to be a Calvinist. So I know what the response is. I know how you're going to respond. Oh, okay. I'm sorry, Angela. I thought you were trying to answer as someone who believes in particular redemption. Let me explain the difference between accomplishing salvation and applying it. The Bible says Jesus accomplished the salvation of all humanity, but it will not be applied until you believe. So I'm confused, Angela. I thought you're answering as someone who believes particular redemption. So the Bible makes a distinction between Jesus perfectly accomplishing redemption and redemption being applied. Accomplishing redemption is different from applying it. He's accomplished it. But in order for God to apply the work of Christ to you, you must believe. It's conditioned on faith. Let's look at Romans 
And then John 3, 16. We'll unpack it a little further. Amen, Susan. Exactly, Lopez. Notice here what Paul says, and John says the same thing. Pay attention, folks. Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation, meaning a sacrifice that appeases God and satisfies his holiness to remove his wrath from us. Through faith in his blood. Bam, there you go. God is propitiated because of the blood of Christ, which you have to receive by faith. Otherwise, his wrath is not removed from you. You catch it? Do you catch it? John 3.16 says the same thing. So let's unpack it a little more. Let's unpack it a little more. You ready? John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So let me explain what he's saying here. Because Jesus came into the world to save it, and he accomplished the redemption of the world, he now accomplished the salvation of the world. Now, when you believe, you'll receive everlasting life. Because Jesus died to save the world, this means now when you believe, you will be saved because he's accomplished your salvation. But you got to believe to receive what Christ has accomplished. That's just biblical teaching. Thank you, Patrick. May the Spirit put us on fire and increase our fire and our passion and our love for God and his word. Live for him and die for him in Jesus' name. Thank you, Sal John. Okay, let's look at John 3.16 one more time. And then I'm going to show you how some Calvinists explain John 3.16 and address their interpretation. Okay, one more time, John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now let me explain what either John or Jesus said. Because God sent Jesus into the world to save the world that he made, and he's now accomplished the salvation of the world, because he's accomplished it, that means now if you believe, you will receive. In other words, eternal life would not be granted to you if Jesus didn't accomplish salvation for the world. But because he's accomplished the salvation of the world, now if you believe, you'll be given salvation. That's what it's saying. You understand what he's saying here? In other words, let's hypothetically assume Jesus never came to the world to save the world. That means you can believe and never receive eternal life. Because your faith is not sufficient to give you eternal life. It is Jesus who saves you and gives you eternal life. So if he didn't come into the world to save the world, I don't care how much you believe, you'd never be saved and never be given eternal life. Because faith is not what saves you. Jesus saves you, and faith is the instrument to receive what Jesus accomplished. Understand what it's saying? In other words, you are wrong to assume it's that your faith that saves you. No, no, no. Even though the Bible says faith saves you, let me explain what the Bible is saying when you read it in its fullness. It's saying your faith is the instrument which then gives you access to what Jesus accomplished. It's my faith that gives me what Jesus accomplished. And what Jesus accomplished is my salvation, everlasting life. If he didn't accomplish it, my faith wouldn't give me anything. My faith wouldn't do anything for me. So he accomplished my faith and my salvation and my everlasting life. And I need to believe then to receive what he has accomplished. So it's not my faith <clears throat> that accomplishes my salvation. It's not my faith that <clears throat> is the basis for my everlasting life. What accomplishes my salvation and what gives me everlasting life is what Jesus did. 
which I now receive by faith. You understand now what it's saying? You understand? So if Jesus never died for your sins and never lived the perfect life to earn everlasting life for you, then you can believe all day, all night, you ain't going to heaven. You won't be given everlasting life because your faith doesn't save you and your faith doesn't cause you to live forever. It's Jesus who saves you and gives you the gift of immortality, everlasting life, which is why you have to believe in him to receive. Because if it was simply faith, then the Muslims would be saved. Buddhists would be saved if they believe in God. And Hindus would be saved. Everyone would be saved who has faith in God. Why aren't they? Because your faith does nothing for you. You have to believe in the one who then accomplished your salvation and gives you the gift of everlasting life. Take care, Andrew. You understand now? Is it making sense or am I confusing you? What the Bible is actually teaching. You understand the message? So what John 3.16 is saying, now if you believe, you'll receive everlasting life because Jesus has come into the world and he's accomplished the salvation of the world. He's earned salvation for the world. So now if you believe, he's going to give you that salvation that he earned and he accomplished. Is that clear? That's what John 3.16 is saying. If I'm confusing you, let me know, because I don't want to go any further if you're being confused. Making sense? Anyone confused, let me know. Because now I'm going to unpack how someone who holds to particular redemption, limited atonement, would explain John 3.16. So here is the other side, and I'm going to respond to it. John, they'll tell you, John 3, 16, when it says, for God so loved the world, that doesn't mean every human creature. They'll say, by the term world, it means Jews and Gentiles without distinction. Let me explain now the other side. They'll tell you the world here doesn't mean every human creature. From a Jewish perspective, the world was divided into two camps, Jews and Gentiles. Jews and Gentiles make up the world. Understand what they're saying now, okay? Here I need you to listen. Listen carefully to the other side. The other side will say, by world, it doesn't mean every creature. It means Jews and Gentiles. Because from a Jewish perspective, the world was divided into two camps. You had the Jews, you had the Gentiles. So what John is saying is, Jesus didn't just come to save the Jews. He came to save the world, meaning Jews and Gentiles. But it doesn't mean every single Jew, every single Gentile. What it means is that Jesus came to accomplish the salvation of people from all the nations, whether Jews or Gentiles. So it's not saying he came to save every human creature. It's saying that when he came to save people, he didn't just came, come to save Jewish people. He came to save people both from Jews and Gentiles. You understand what they're saying by the term world? They're saying world doesn't mean every human creature. Because from a Jewish perspective, the world consists of Jews and Gentiles. So when you say Jews and Gentiles, you mean the world. But not every Jew, not every Gentile. So John 3 is simply saying Jesus doesn't just come to save Jewish people. He comes to save people from all the nations. So he's going to say people are Jews and people are Gentiles. But it doesn't mean everyone. Okay? So you understand the first part of their position. Not everyone. The world here doesn't mean everyone. By world means Jews and Gentiles without distinction. Because from a Jewish perspective, the world means Jews and Gentiles. So it doesn't mean every Jew, every Gentile. It simply means people from Jewish background and Gentiles. But not every one of them. Can you understand their position? I'm going to get to that, Angela, in a minute. I'm going to get to that. Before I get to that, I just want you to understand what the position is saying. Right? You understand what they mean now? 
They'll tell you world doesn't mean every creature. It means Jews and Gentiles without distinction, but not every Jew, not every Gentile. Okay, if you understood this, I can go to the second part of their argument. Anyone confused? Let me know. If not, we can proceed. Okay, so no one's confused? Then they'll say, yeah, yeah, James White and others, Lopez, he's not the only one. He didn't create this argument, okay? Then they'll say, this is the second part of the response. They go, the Greek of John 3.16 doesn't say whosoever believeth. They'll tell you the Greek literally says, so that the believing ones, because they'll tell you, <clears throat> let me get the Greek, hold on. I hope I'm not boring you with this, guys. And I'm going to show you why this argument doesn't work. It does not work because of the prologue and because of other factors. Hold on. Oops, let's go. Okay, here. Okay, here. Click there. Thank God that they translate the Greek with English letters so you can see. Now you're going to see it says, Enna pas ho uh, pistuon, pistuon, pistuon. Enna pas, so that pas all, ho ha pistuon, 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 pisteon. I'm trying to say how a Greek reader would say it. Do you see that? Do you see this phrase? Pas ha pistuon? Pistuon, ha, let me get there. Okay. Ha, pas, sorry. Pas, ha, sorry. I don't get sorry. Ha, pas, ha. Lord Jesus, loosen my tongue. Pistuon. 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 I'm trying to see how Greek we pronounce it. Okay. Ha, uh, pas, ha, pistuon. Pistuan, Pistuan, did I transliterate correctly? All right, yeah, I did. Okay, they'll tell you this is a present active participle. What is a present active participle? A participle is a verbal action, a verbal adjective. It's ascribing you by an action you do, right? It's ascribing you by an action you do. A verbal adjective means you're being described by an action you undertake. For example, the boxer. Boxer. See, I'm describing you by what you do. Box. Kicker. Right? You get it? So they'll say, because it's a present active participle, it literally translates all the believing ones. Right? All the believing ones. So they'll tell you, this is how you're supposed to translate it. I'll get there, bro brother. Just be patient. Okay? They'll say, for God so loved the world, so that all the believing ones may not perish but have everlasting life. So you see, the world doesn't mean everyone. It means all the believing ones from the Jews and Gentiles. You understand how they're translating it now? You understand what they're telling you? They're saying, number one, world doesn't mean every human creature. World has to be understood from a Jewish perspective because the Jews divided the world into two camps, Jews and Gentiles. So by world, John is saying, God didn't just love the Jews to save people from them. He loved all nations to save people from all nations. So they'll say literally, John 3, 16 is saying, because God loved all nations and didn't just love Israel, he's going to save the believing ones out of them. So they'll say basically, the world doesn't mean every human creature. It means God hasn't limited the saving work of Jesus just for the Jews. Jesus comes to save people from all nations. So by world, it means all the believing ones from all the nations will be saved. Because Jesus didn't just come to save the believing ones from the Jews. He came to save the believing ones from all the nations. So they'll say that if you read it properly, it's not that he came to save the, the whole entire human race, but he came to save the believing ones out of... <laughs> The Jews and the Gentiles. You get the point how they're interpreting it? Do you see how they're interpreting it? 
It's the believing ones that Jesus saves. So the world means Jews and Gentiles, but not every Jew, not every Gentile. The believing ones from Jews and Gentiles. Okay, do you understand their objection? So now I can refute it. Are you ready for the refutation? What's the refutation? Number one, this interpretation ignores the prologue. Remember what James White said in his book? You must interpret the Gospel of John in light of the prologue, John 1, verses 1 to 18. Right? This interpretation completely ignores the prologue because the prologue has already told you what that world is that Jesus came to save. And I already showed you that in light of John 1, 10, the world that Jesus came to save, the world that Jesus entered, is the world that he created, that he brought into being. Who is excluded? John 1.10 says he was in the world, and the world was created, came into him being by him. Who's excluded? Anyone excluded? So when it says the sun came into the world, the true light came into the world, the world he made, the world he brought into being, the world he created. Who wasn't created by the word? Who's excluded? Who in the world that he entered is excluded from his work of creating them, giving them life, and bringing them into being? No one. The entire humankind, the entire world of human beings, he brought into being, he created. So then if I read John 3, 16, line of John 1, 10, you cannot possibly deny, if you're going to let the prologue interpret John 3 for you, that the world here that God sent the Son into to save has to mean the world of human beings, the world of humanity. That means all human beings. You with me there? So that's the first response. The first response. Send S S of Dara to the Blackstone to lick and smooch it like a pagan dog that he is. Okay. That's the first response. You want to hear what the second response is? The second part of my refutation to that interpretation? The second part of my response to that interpretation? John 3.18. John 3.18. And again, let me be honest, without sounding rude or arrogant, decimates and destroys this interpretation. This interpretation cannot be true in light of the prologue and in John 3.18. Because let's look at John 3.18. John 3.18. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Now, let's look at the Greek. John 3.18 itself is sufficient to refute this. But when you add the prologue, this shows this interpretation cannot be true. It cannot be accurate. It cannot be the meaning of the context of John 3.16.18, especially in light of the prologue. Let's look at the Greek. Are you ready? Go to John 3.18, interlinear. Remember that phrase, pas, ha, uh, pistuon? Ha pistuon means the believing ones. Pas all. Ha pistuon means all the believing ones. Okay, guys, please go to John 3.18. Notice again the first part. Notice how it's translated. Ha pistuon. Pistuon. The one believing, the believing one. Okay, that's again present active participle. So we can say the believing ones, those believing on him will not be judged. But I want you to catch the second part. But may, you see it says day may, may means not. Pistuon, pistuon. Folks, literally the Greek here, ha, day, may, pistuon, literally means the not believing ones. It too is a present, present active participle. The not believing ones. The believing ones versus the not believing ones. It's a present active participle. It's the same tense in Greek. 
So John 3, 16 saying, the believing ones, believing in him, won't be judged. But the not believing ones will be condemned for not believing on his name. Now, you understand what that means? The not believing ones, that too is a present active participle. The not believing ones, that too is a present active participle. But why are the not believing ones condemned? They're condemned for not believing in the name of the Son of God. But hold on, I'm confused. Why are the not believing ones condemned for not believing in the Son of God if the Son of God didn't come also to save them? Why are they condemned? Remember, according to this view, Jesus only comes to save the believing ones, meaning the elect will be set apart and believe. But why does John 3, 18 says, the not believing ones are condemned for not believing in the name of the only begotten Son of God if the Son didn't come also to accomplish their salvation. If he didn't come to accomplish their salvation, then why are they condemned for not believing in him when he doesn't come to save them? Are you with me there? Do you understand how this refutes the argument? So what is the present act of participle? So what it says believing ones? How does that change the exegesis? This is why I don't want you to be intimidated by people who appear to appeal to Greek because oftentimes, I'm not saying it about white, I'm not saying it about them. Oftentimes people appeal to Greek to overwhelm you, intimidate you, that they have some knowledge of the original language that proves their argument is airtight in order to intimidate you who don't know the language. So what? It's a present active part participle. Even the phrase that says, those not believing, that too is a present active participle. It says, the not believing ones, that too is a present active participle. And? But the real question is this. Why does John 3.18 say, the ones not believing in the name of the only begotten Son of God are condemned when, according to this view, Jesus doesn't come to save the not believing ones who are condemned. He only comes to save the elect, and the elect will be believing ones. So when he comes to save the believing ones, not the unbelieving ones. Because that's not what John 3 is saying. John 3 is not saying Jesus comes only to save the believers who are the elect, will be set apart and enabled to believe he came to save the world so that if you are in the world and he made you, he came to save you. That's why if you don't believe in him, you're condemned, not because he didn't come to save you, but because you didn't believe in him. Because though he accomplished your salvation, it's your refusal to believe in him that results in your condemnation. Not that he didn't come to save you. You understand now? So you see how the prologue of John 1 and John 3.18 refutes this interpretation. This interpretation cannot be true because it contradicts the prologue and makes no sense in light of the context of John 3.18. Are you with me there? Did you guys get it or no? Who is confused? So re-listen to this over again and don't be intimidated, overwhelmed by Greek. Okay, now before you ask me a question, do you want me to give you further proof that John 3.16 is referring to the entire world of humanity, the whole world of humanity, the whole human race, that very world of humanity that Jesus created, according to John 1.10. You want further proof? Let's go to John 3, 14, 8, and 15. John 3, 14, and 15. John 3, 14, and 15. I can't. Okay, read now. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. That whosoever believeth, let's translate it the way James White and others would have us translated, so that the believing ones, the believing ones, those believing in him, 
should not perish but have eternal life. Notice what Jesus said. Just like the bronze serpent was lifted up, I'll be lifted up. So just like they looked to the snake, the serpent, and were healed, all who look to me will be healed as well. Folks, can I ask you a question? When God told Moses to fashion the bronze serpent and lift it up, did God not say whoever was bitten and looks to it will be healed? So that God provided the bronze serpent for the healing of everyone who was bitten, provided they looked to the bronze serpent. If they didn't look to the bronze serpent, it was their fault. With me there? Can you honestly tell me when Moses fashioned the bronze serpent, it wasn't fashioned for everyone who's bitten by the serpent in order to be healed lest they die? Who was excluded? God said, this bronze serpent will be for everyone bitten by the serpents so they don't die, provided they look to it. If they don't look to it, it's their fault they die. And Jesus uses that as a contrast with himself. Just like the bronze serpent, I'll be lifted up. So anyone that looks to me will be saved. No one is exempted. So then how can you, for the life of me, argue that the world hill doesn't mean the entire human race that Jesus created, that he comes to accomplish the salvation for the whole human race, not just the elect. How can you argue that way in light of verses 14 to 15, in light of verse 18, in light of the prologue? How can you do that? Anyone tell me? These are some of the reasons that led me to reject limited atonement. And I believe that was the work of the Holy Spirit. I believe limited atonement is wrong, but obviously those who believe it's right think I'm wrong. But one, at once I used to believe it too, and I used to argue for it. But now I can no longer argue for it because I see it's not scriptural. There's too much evidence against it, right? So that's why I don't believe it. Clear? Did it make sense? If I didn't confuse anyone, it made sense. This session is officially over. We're done with this session. How you doing, Danny? Daniel? God bless you. Anyone not get it? Now, what was your question, sister? You had a question. Sister had a question. Anna had a question. All, in all honesty, just to let, I just need your feedback. How clear, how sound, how solid was the case that you just heard? If we take seriously what even James White says about interpreting the Gospel of John light of the prologue, right? Right? In light of the prologue, right here. Right? And it wasn't confusing, right? I didn't confuse you? Angela, what has that got to do with the contextual meaning that Jesus died to accomplish the salvation of the whole world, meaning the entire world of human beings that he made, if they only believe? What does that have to do with that point? You're asking me a point that you think it's related, but it's not. All you're doing is pitting scripture against scripture, and you're not resolving the clear and plain meaning of the passage that says Christ comes to die to save the whole human race, to accomplish their salvation. No, but I want to know, because you're now arguing as a Calvinist, because you've been influenced by the, those who espouse five-point Calvinism, because I know the argument. Someone dead in sin cannot believe in Christ unless the Holy Spirit enables him. So if Christ did accomplish the salvation of the whole world, why doesn't God then enable everyone to believe? Even to ask me the question, and even if I can't answer it, how does that trump the plain reading of the context? See, that's only an argument that is raised to avoid dealing with the exegesis. Even if I can't resolve what you said, I don't have an answer of how both can be true. What has that got to do with the plain meaning of the passage that if you interpret it correctly 
and not impose your tradition upon it, the plain meaning of the passage, the contextual meaning of the passage is Christ comes to accomplish the salvation of the whole human race. You get my point? So though your question is a good one, it's irrelevant to the exegesis of John 3, 16, 18. Even though in Calvinists say, no, it is relevant. No, it's not. It isn't relevant. It may be relevant to your system, and you got to make it relevant and try to evade, avoid dealing with the plain contextual meaning of John 3. You get my point? Yes. Guys, you know my Patreon pages and my PayPal account? If God is sturdy up to want to partner with me, because I do need regular contributors contributing regularly, ongoing basis, not a one-time thing, to continue to do ministry and to provide for my children. So if God wants me in ministry, may the spirits to your hearts to partner with me. Pray and fast for me and my daughters. You saw the text message from my ex-wife blessing me and telling me I look good, something I have not heard from her. You know God is working in her. He's being a fire in her heart to break her, to come back to Jesus. Pray, Lord Jesus, save Michelle Gabriel, save Sam's daughters, and remove Martin Simon Yako from my children's life. And save the Lord, save your servant Jesus from that corrupt, wicked, whore of a judge, that daughter of Satan. She doesn't touch me and remove the lawyers from me in Jesus' name. Yes, I don't know if you guys heard it. Let me read it to you again. Let me end it this way. And I, I got it as I was doing the session. Out of nowhere, she sent me this on my daughter's phone, which you know she's not supposed to contact me. Here you go. Her name is Michelle Gabriel. Watch this. I got this at 8.45 p.m. my time as I was live streaming. Girls are sleeping because I'd send them pictures of me from the conference. We had an early day because of Zippy's piano recital because my youngest daughter had a piano recital that I couldn't be there. Robbed of that blessing to see my baby play the piano. She played two songs. I will send the video tomorrow so you can see. You look good, Sam. I've never heard her say that. She would always say, you're fat, you're obese. I don't find you attractive. I don't love you. I'll never love you. I'll never find you attractive. That's what I heard. Not lying. Have a blessed night. I've never heard that either. Have a blessed night. Please send me some pictures of them while they were babies. They were all on your old computer. I want to make a collage for Sarai's birthday. Amazing to hear it from her. So no, God is answering your prayers and you're fasting for me, my daughters, and for others. And if you want to know God answer your prayers, go see the video of David Wood's brother, Manny, in a coma that the doctor said he's pretty much dead and brain damaged. But the doctors are liars because the true doctor is Jesus. He's now fully awake, recovered, conscious, laughing, knows what he's hearing. Even though his speech is impaired for now, he'll get that back too. That's how real our Jesus is. Pray, Lord Jesus, remove Martin Simon Yako from my daughter's lives. He's got to go. Convict Michelle, repent. Bring my children to me. Grant me the grace to get healthier and holier. Provide for us and remove that judge from my life. In Jesus' name, keep her away to serve the triumph God. We love you, Father, Son, and Spirit. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Jesus Christ is Yahovah to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Come sooner than later. Later, Maranatha. Father, Son, and Spirit, you are God and you alone, and we belong to you. Fight our battles and save us from the evil one and save us from our flesh. Save us from sin in Jesus' name. Lord willing, I may do a live stream tomorrow. It's Sunday, but if not, look for me Monday. Here's the apartment. Thank you. Pray now. My apartment will be filled, first and foremost, with the presence of Jesus. The Holy Spirit will fill this place. It's his, and will be filled with the presence of my daughters. They'll be here sooner than later. Love you guys. Christ is risen, risen indeed.